Good afternoon and welcome to the HR Congress podcast. Today, we'll be speaking with Aid McCormick about the future of work, technology, the gig economy, and much more. Good afternoon and welcome to the HR Congress podcast today. And today I'm joined by Aid McCormick, who is the founder of the Digital Readiness Institute. He is a frequent keynote speaker, author, advisor, and futurist. And his professional focus is on helping people thrive in the digital age with a particular interest in human performance, especially around the areas of sociality, movement, and attention. So thank you for joining me today, Aid. Very unusual times that we're living in, and I'm looking forward to having a conversation with you. And I'm absolutely, Ben, delighted to be involved in the podcast. Awesome. So one of the things I usually like to do to start a conversation off is obviously we've just met. It's the first time I've spoken to you. And I'd, I'd love to hear just a little more about yourself, uh, your background, and how you ended up in, in this area. Sure. Um, started off uh, studying astrophysics, worked at the European Space Agency, primarily a software engineer for the first decade of my career then started to demystify technology for business people, and that bubbled all the way up into the boardroom. So a lot of my time is spent with sort of uh, leaders and also in executive education. Um, I would classify myself at best as a near futurist. Nobody can actually tell the future, and we're living that reality as we speak. I tend to talk about things that are happening somewhere, but they're sufficiently interesting uh, and unevenly distributed, if you like, so that, you know, where I speak, uh, people are hearing things for the first time. But typically, the things I'm talking about are, are happening in some capacity. And that brings us on to one of the purposes of the conversation today is that you're going to be presenting a session with us at the Digital HR Innovation Week, which formerly was a summit that was supposed to be taking place uh, next weekend, actually, in The Hague. And your session is going to be entitled Augmented Talent, Harnessing the Cognitive Capital of People at Work. I'd like to maybe start with how has work or talent changed over the last 15 to 20 years, perhaps, as a first little snapshot. And what do you see as some of the major shifts occurring in, in the world of work at the moment, leading into a discussion about the coronavirus situation? Sure. I think possibly if i just slightly reorient that um you know the coronavirus in many respects is the uh let's call it the closing ceremony of the industrial era the industrial era has been closing um for some time but many organizations have been hanging on to their industrial era models because they continue to generate cash in order to, to remain solvent they focused on efficiency as opposed to innovation in that industrial era model, the talent, the people, tend to be really extensions of the machine in the sense that they um, are process cogs. They are organic technology placeholders until the technology arrives. COVID-19 is just one, if you like, macroeconomic vector that's changing things, and it's one that we all can relate to as we speak. But there are other uh, macroeconomic factors or vectors driving the changes in the world, not least the um, exponential growth in digital technologies and biological technologies, along with increased globalization of supply chains, uh, acute talent wars. And, and when it comes to talent, um, the definition or the new definition of talent is being a person being able to do something of value that cannot be replicated by an algorithm or a robot. So what we're seeing in the market at the moment is a lot of organizations are sort of taking this as an opportunity to shed their staff. Uh, smart organizations will divert as much of their energy and love as possible towards their staff, but their staff in turn need to raise the bar in terms of adding value beyond that what uh, technology can deliver. So there's pressure from the leadership to 
if you like, become more enlightened in respect of the value associated with their people. And in turn, the people themselves have to raise their game uh, to justify being employed uh, rather than being replaced by a piece of technology. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about is this concept of the gig economy, because I've always been a little uneasy with the definition of it and, and what it actually means for a lot of people. I've read some people saying that this situation at the moment will be the, the end of the gig economy era uh, and that we're moving into some kind of more hybridized version of temporary work or these kind of gig contracts. What do you see happening in, in this area and what would your thoughts be on how someone who's perhaps a gig worker is going to be working in the near future? Well, I think it's a question of at what point will we all become gig workers? And by gig worker, I mean somebody who is not on a permanent employment contract. And that can be a pizza delivery person. It can be a Fortune 500 CEO. So I think the media has dragged the gig, the gig economy or the focus of the gig economy towards, if you like, uh, people who are in danger of being exploited because there, there is no sort of social support when they're doing this kind of gig work. But gig work, again, can be done by, um, you know, professional people, leaders, and so on. Because we are now increasingly moving into an uncertain and volatile world, um, talent planning is going to become next to impossible. And the only way to um, deal with talent management in those conditions is to employ more freelance people. Uh, none of us know what business we're going to be in in six months or a year's time. Even our visions are likely to change as a result of the, the vectors that are impacting us on a day-to-day -day basis. Again, COVID-19 only being just one of those. So we are gravitating to a gig economy. Um, and the more people get used to the precariousness of not being able to see their career in one company from, if you like, graduation or leaving school through to retirement and of course we're beyond that but there was a time when that was the case we're now moving to an era now where people don't have a career for life they're going to have a life of careers and many of those careers will play out in parallel so the very nature of work is um, going to change is changing i've been living it for over a quarter of a, a century um, the notion of a side hustle is something that you might associate with more entrepreneurial this time next year we'll all have at least one side hustle i think the entrepreneurial side of things changing is actually a, a very important part because in some sense the the uncertainty and the the troubles that people are going through at the moment might be the genesis of uh, a lot of great ideas hopefully and of course these new great concepts or great businesses or great ideas can be born out of uh, the trials of people in entrepreneurial spirit. That could be a, a great side effect of, of the changes that are happening. But I think there are a lot of people who have that just fundamental uncertainty, not only with the coronavirus situation, but just the way that careers or a lifetime of careers are changing. And that can be, of course, a significant challenge, but it's a mental shift that a lot of people have to make. And I think leadership uh, of organizations, of people uh, generally, at the moment, leaders particularly need to have that uh, mindset shift in mind. So perhaps I'd like to ask you a question about leaders and organizations, whether they're HR leaders or business leaders generally. What are the types of mindset shifts that you think would be useful for them if they're approaching the world at the moment hopefully they've already been thinking about it but what would you recommend that they start enacting in their lives well i guess you know if we look at the um the embryonic end of the spectrum you know the ceos the leaders there are living by their wits they are operating often in a lean startup mode uh, and if they're sensitive enough to the market they will pivot towards the opportunity rather than blindly following the initial strategy statement that they produced on day one. Now, if we scale this up to the other end, the uh, you know, top of the Fortune 500, you have chief executives there who are adhering as much as they can to the two-year, three-year, five-year strategic plan and, and ignoring reality. Um, COVID-19 
is a real slap in the face from a reality perspective. So you might say those leaders going forward need to move their mindset away from strategic planning over multiple years and more situational awareness, much like a, um, a fighter pilot in a, in a dogfight. Now that's easy for me to say, and it's not easy for CEOs to do because they're judged um, in many cases by uh, stock markets, by analysts, by investors. So they have to go through this illusion of pretending they know what's going to happen in the next quarter, in the next half year, in the next year. That, that fantasy is, is crumbling and these strategic plans are out of date before uh, the CEOs hit the save button. So essentially, strategy needs a rethink. And those strategies, those leaders, I should say, who are able to move from the old school MBA strategic planning model to something more akin to you know, a boxing match or a fighter pilot dogfight, those are the ones that are going to win. If an organization is looking at alternative ways to create value and to unleash potential in their people, what are some of the things that they can do practically now, today? How do they go about unleashing potential when it's needed most, which is now and in the immediate aftermath of a crisis situation? Sure. There's two types of companies. One's where the, there is mutual trust between the leadership and the people and the opposite where there is no trust. The, those companies where there is no trust, the leaders at this point in time are sweating heavily because they don't know whether their people are, are working from home or what they're doing. They've used a kind of very old school factory model, you know, drum beating approach. And now they can't see the rowers uh, because the rowers are, are not on the ship, so to speak. So job number one is to develop a culture of trust. And then once you have a culture of trust, then you will get through the storm together. That's, that's job number one. Um, once you have that in place, then you need to say to yourself, well, actually at this point in time, in many cases, um, the organization only has one bet in the market and that's the primary business model. That's very, very risky. Um, the trick is to have multiple bets in the market. So you start to run your business less as a factory and more as a portfolio of experiments. Once you get into that mind uh, way of thinking, then you can start to unleash the true potential of your people. Now, if you spent an absolute fortune recruiting, if you like, process followers, let's say you're a big bank, for example, you can't turn those people into innovative, out of the box, design thinking individuals. If you put them on the appropriate courses, you'll just confuse them. So there is no point trying to reinvent people who have spent their careers operating in this kind of mindless factory manner. You might as well keep turning the handle with their part of the business. But there'll be some of those people who actually do uh, want to be creative that haven't had their creativity gene denatured uh, or you may have to recruit in such people, and those will be the people that will uh, staff your, um, your parallel portfolio startup experiments. So put yourself in the shoes of an HR professional. What would you recommend that they do right now to start thinking about how they can add value to their organization? They need to decouple themselves pretty rapidly from the, um, the brand. HR, because as I touched on before, in many cases, HR is a kind of extension of the procurement department and as such is just bringing cogs into the, um, into the factory. But unlike other parts of procurement, these cogs tend to play up and get hangovers and aspirations and, and, and have, um, you know, they're, they're more difficult to manage. HR needs to move away from that, if you like, organic cog management, in my view, uh, to being the, if you like, the um, cognitive asset director, in the sense that they are responsible for creating the conditions uh, for great work to be done, and then acquiring and retaining the best talent, so that great talent does great work with other great talent, um, in a in a in a market pleasing manner 
Um, so essentially the um, HR director or leader becomes, if you like, the cognitive asset director or, or cognitive architect of the organization, because that's where the potential of the people uh, truly lives. And in that respect, the future is looking very bright um, for, for us as workers, because we will feel more fulfilled in using our brains as they were intended. And for the organization, because those organizations that can harness our collective cognitive capacity are going to, you know, sprint away from those that still basically treat people as brainless. Right. So in harnessing that cognitive capacity, organizations can really unleash talent. I think that that's fairly clear. I'd like to throw technology into this mix as well, because I have a very uneasy relationship with the way that technology is um, you know, potentially applied or implemented at work. Not to say that I'm some kind of doomsday scenario <laughs> prepper when it comes to technology, but we've already seen that humans and technology are more or less merging at the moment for better or worse whether it's social media or more advanced cognitive technologies, AI, robotics, etc. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of humans and machines, technology at work? For me, this is an uncertain question, and I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. Sure. I guess if we look at the future, it's, it's perhaps got three phases to it. The first phase is us trying to eke more value out of our old school industrial models, though that, that period is increasingly uh, becoming shorter. Then there's a period where we harness both technology and humans. So you might say uh, it's artificial cognition with human cognition. So AI, uh, sorry, uh, humans plus or and technology. That's gonna play out probably for a decade at minimum, uh, but maybe longer. But at some point, the technology will become so advanced that it can outperform us even when we're operating at full cognitive tilt. So that's game over for humans economically. That's not necessarily a bad thing for society, as long as society has the mechanism uh, to keep, if you like, um, its citizens uh, stimulated, satisfied and, and connected so to speak. Um, so there's a bit of a, you know, it could go utopian, it could go dystopian, and, and certainly governments have to start thinking about that today. But from a corporate perspective, uh, the foreseeable future is very much humans and technology. Augmentation of humans is not some new, uh, you know, a new idea or fad of the week. You know, soon, the time that we first picked up a rock uh, with intentions of using it as a tool, that's when augmentation kicked off, and that was some time ago. From my perspective, at least my uneducated perspective on this area, I feel like the business world, the private sector, has been at the vanguard of the implementation of a lot of these technologies. And I'd be very interested and curious to see how everything develops. But at least there is this option for organizations to look at the tools that are out there, the technology that's being developed, and to see what works and what doesn't. And I can only imagine that the, the current coronavirus situation is already seriously making inroads into the way that some companies are looking at uh, augmenting their, their human talent with technological talent, because after all, a robot can't catch the coronavirus, right? But yeah, it's, it's, it's a real strange time. And I think there's going to be so, a lot of questions being asked about how humans and machines will interact. I think what's likely to happen is that people are going to be sitting at home now and they'll have been sitting at home for a few weeks and they'll be thinking to themselves, actually, I've never felt this um, healthy and I don't miss commuting for two to four hours a day. Uh, so I've reclaimed part of my life back. And the reason I've been putting in those extra four hours a day is because I get massively well paid for doing work that essentially involves me living in a spreadsheet or, or something similar. I think a lot of people will reflect on their lives, particularly as they see loved ones um, succumb to the virus and say, well, actually, I could live on a lot less money and have a much you know, higher quality life. And because I can't get out now and buy goods, I can still use Amazon, of course, um, but you know, the pleasure of 
I don't know, buying things you don't need to impress people you don't really like, it doesn't work anymore. So I think we might see a capitalism reset and we may even enter what you might call a phase of frugal capitalism. Uh, and that will confuse governments. It will start to make GDP look a bit wobbly. And, and then the world basically has to start thinking about how does it uh, redefine growth? I think we're probably veering off into politics, um, which is not necessarily separate to the conversation, but is certainly not the main uh, talking point. So to, to return, I know that you're going to be presenting your session at the event. Could you please just quickly summarize some, some key points about what you'll be speaking about, sorry, in the session, and then how people can reach out to you with any questions or comments if they want to learn more about you or what you do? Sure. Um, well, in essence, I mean, I've, this, this, um, my theme is generally around uh, disruption and transformation. And you might say COVID-19 is, you know, is a living case study in support of that. So I'll be talking about how um, the world is changing with respect to leadership, talent management, uh, business models, changing attitudes to risk and innovation, uh, the impact of technology, including augmentation and uh, robotics and AI. And I will touch on a model I've developed uh, around, if you like, uh, tribal behavior and how to move forward into an unknowable future. So I've, I've kind of worked up a, uh, a model that essentially is about turning inert factories into living, sensing organisms. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the thrust of it. Um, I write quite a lot. So on my website, aidmccormack.com, I've got a blog um, where there's a lot of content. If you just put my name into Google, because I've written for the Financial Times for about a decade, uh, and other publications. So there's, I've got quite a lot of content out there. So there, there'll be no difficulty in finding my perspectives if, if you're interested. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining me today. I am aware you've probably got to head off and do some other things and probably have lots of meetings backed up. And I'm aware, of, I'm conscious of my propensity to veer off topic. So thank you again for joining me. And yeah, I look forward to hearing your presentation in May, I think May, May 18th to the 22nd. That's great. I enjoyed the conversation, Ben.